So this is what the current research approach looked like. It was a mixed methods design. We thought uh, at getting families to fill out questionnaires, but then actually also speaking with families in an in-depth in way would provide us more insight and help us to, to reach some conclusions and to make some recommendations. So we, um, we, as I said, we first uh, examined uh, the relevant variables quantitatively uh, with a very large sample, and then we uh, conducted follow-up interviews um, to gain a more informed and deepened understanding of the, of the identified processes. Um, and so this visual is really just to orient you as to how our study uh, proceeded. So part one was the larger quantitative component uh, in which our participants completed some online surveys. And then part two involved a smaller subset of families who uh, we spoke with in interviews. So I think uh, it makes the most sense to go through the larger component first and then I'll transition to the, to the interviews. Uh, so 160 caregivers of children with ASD between the ages of 2 and 35 uh, participated in the study and the table demonstrates the distribution of participants across those three funding programs. So you can see that the bulk of participants were in that 6 to 18 group. Um, so of those who had children aged 19 and over, 13 received CLBC funds and uh, most individuals were from Greater Vancouver. Uh, with the remaining individuals coming from 13 other regional districts. And this visual shows the distribution of participants from each. So you can see that we have a lot of work to do to reach these uh, different communities. Here's a, a summary of our kind of family demographic information, what our, family, our, participa our participating families looked like uh, across these three programs. Uh, you can see that within each uh, program, the majority of respondents were mothers. Again, that's not going to be a surprise. Uh, quite a range of ethnicities were reported, and most families were in married or common law relationships. In terms of the, uh, the child demographics, this table shows uh, the average age within the programs as well as the male to female uh, ratio. And so as part of this quantitative component, all participants indicated how satisfied they were with the resources and funds available to their family on a scale that ranged from very dissatisfied to very satisfied. Uh, and then they were encouraged to provide qualitative comments uh, where they could elaborate on their chosen satisfaction rating. Participants also completed a scale assessing family quality of life across five uh, domains, and these are what the domains look like, and I'm happy to talk more about um, what those look like or how we came up with those um, in the questions. So overall, only about one quarter of participants indicated they were satisfied or very satisfied with the resources and funds available to their family. And when we broke this down across the three funding programs, it was apparent that as available funding decreased, so did family satisfaction. So in other words, those in the youngest and oldest groups were the most and least satisfied, respectively. And you can see that uh, in the over 19 group, no one indicated that they were very satisfied. And so, as I mentioned, we also encouraged our participants to provide comments indicating why they chose those ratings. And um, analysis of these comments revealed, revealed three broad themes. So a very small proportion shared positive feedback, whereas most indicated uh, that they felt the provided amount was insufficient, and then they elaborated regarding uh, the perceived limitations. So the majority of comments within positive feedback uh, reflected participants' expressions of gratitude that this, that this program actually existed. They communicated an appreciation for, for receiving funds that could be dedicated to helping their child's development, and they were grateful for the resources and expertise that it afforded their family. Most, however, indicated that the provided amount was grossly insufficient. So caregivers indicated that funding limitations prevented them from accessing the desired range of services and specialists and from utilizing the services that they had uh, to the extent that they felt would be required to adequately meet their children's needs. 
As a result, caregivers often felt that they were placed in the very difficult position of having to choose among uh, services that they viewed as necessary, or they were forced to supplement uh, with their own funds if, if they were in a position to do so. They were also, uh, many also communicated concerns about the substantial funding decreases that they were facing uh, when their children turned either uh, six or 19. So one parent said, we know that there are limits to what we can expect, but we also want our child to grow up successfully. Within limitations, caregivers most frequently expressed uh, frustration with how time consuming and complicated they found service navigation to be. And participants noted that uh, professionals and programs may be unavailable due to limited options in uh, perhaps more rural locations and be or because they had prohibitively long wait lists. The service system was also described as inflexible uh, due to restrictions on how families uh, could access their funds. So they desired a greater range of el eligible service options and wanted more uh, flexibility in how funds were dispensed from year to year. And finally, uh, many described the system as overly burdensome for parents. So the, they felt that the requirement that parents be the coordinators of service delivery, uh, they found that very overwhelming and time consuming, and many were unsure of where to find appropriate resources. So where to find support in this role, or where to even, tur tur where to, even turn to find the appropriate services for their child. So we then looked at the effect of uh, the particular funding program on family quality of life. And this analysis uh, did reveal a significant relationship between funding program and family's quality of life satisfaction. And when we did follow-up tests on this, what was interesting is, was that the only significant relationship was actually with the, with specifically with the disability-related support domain of quality of life. And then when we looked at how uh, amount of funding, so the under 6, 6 to 18, and 19 plus, how that was related uh, to satisfaction with disability related support. We found that caregivers of children um, who were over the age of 19 reported significantly lower satisfaction with disability related support than those who were either in receipt of the under 6 funds or the 6 to 18 funds. So I'm going to um, transition now to the interview component, and then we'll kind of uh, sum, sum it up. 15 individuals representing 12 families participated in our, in our follow-up interviews, uh, including six families who identified themselves as high in quality of life, and six who self-identified as low. So on the quality of life survey that we had families complete online, we asked an item that we called global quality of life. So we said, overall, how satisfied are you with your family's quality of life? So we felt it was important to actually ask that question, as well as you know have our 25-item uh, instrument that created a kind of a composite measure of quality of life. We wanted to see how those two things actually lined up. And having this uh, more global item allowed us to choose individuals who felt that you know, things were great for them, we've got a great quality of life, whereas, and also choose those who felt they were really struggling. So when we did these interviews, we felt we could get a better range of, of perceptions. And we, um, we had high ambitions uh, in this component to include uh, to do a better job of including members of the, the family system. So a lot of research um, is really based on the mother's perspective and we were hoping to build on this and, and include fathers and you know caregiving partners, whoever that might be. And uh, I think it speaks volume that volumes that only three actually agreed to this. So we had three mom dads participate in these interviews, but all were from the high quality of life group. Um, so, and I'll just note that consistent with the aims of uh, the larger study, all the interview participants had children who were between the ages of six and 18 years. So our interviews were approximately an hour to an hour and a half, and we did them, uh, we tried to make them as easy on families as we could, so we did them over the phone, we did them in person, or we had a few by Skype. And we talked about a range of, of topics, but I, I'm going to focus on uh, the service-related ones here. 
So the first uh, topic that I'll uh, go over is we, we asked families about receiving the autism diagnosis and how they felt that affected their quality of life. So when, when we spoke about that, uh, families talked about two central themes. Within benefits, uh, caregivers focused on the new access to support that accompanied the designation, as well as the sense of validation and uh, relief that they experienced. So they communicated, many communicated that they had a feeling something was going on, uh, the diagnosis process was so long and complex, they were actually relieved to finally have this, this label and they could go forward with accessing services. So one, one family member spoke about how this actually helped to ease their family relations and she said, now we're more open. It made everyone feel okay to be themselves. Participants who reflected on uh, detriments spoke about the difficult path to diagnosis that was complicated by long wait times, uh, other, member, other family members' negative emotional responses such as grief and denial. Uh, and their perceptions of having very little guidance during this significant period of transition. Uh, so this is uh, another mother. She said, it didn't alleviate any kind of issues that I had not related to my son. There was no holistic view. And when we looked at uh, the kinds of statements that those in the high quality of life group said as compared to those in the low quality of life group, we found that they focused quite equally on both benefits and detriments. Um, but only high quality of life participants indicated that they would like uh, greater guidance, that they saw this as a real gap that needed to be addressed. When participants were asked how well qual uh, family quality of life was addressed within service delivery, they reflected on both community-based and school-based services. Uh, discussions about community-based service, services reflected three themes. So they talked about the impressions regarding the autism funding system, as well as strengths and gaps. So similarly, although they uh, acknowledged how much they appreciated the autism program funds, they indicated that the provided amount was insufficient to access desired support, and uh, caregivers also described the funding system as inefficient, inflexible, and at times inconsistent. Those who shared positive experiences in, when, in which they felt the broader needs of the family uh, were considered in addition to those of the child's emphasized the practices of information sharing and partnering with professionals. And it was high quality of life participants uh, who were more likely to elaborate with these kinds of specific uh, practices. All of our interview participants felt that quality of life was often not appropriately addressed within service, and they identified uh, quite glaring gaps, such as a prevailing lack of guidance and, and feeling quite alone in service navigation. And the only difference here between high and low uh, quality of life family pertained to their descriptions of the service system as reactive as opposed to proactive, and it was low quality of life participants who felt that um, their family had to reach almost a state of crisis and before any kind of intervention or, or uh, need was addressed. So here's, I just, I want to include a few quotes here to emphasize these points. Uh, the first one is about how limited funds have prevented a family from accessing the services that they see as priorities. So it says, um, the funding is not even close to enough. So then you're in a position where you have to choose major priorities. Out of all of these things that my kid really needs, what does he need most desperately? And that sucks. And the last two are reflective of this perception of lack of guidance. So in this middle one, the father uh, is speaking about feeling quite alone and in, in finding out about service navigation. And he describes the service system as the wild, wild west. So he says, everyone for themselves. There's no specialist that you can go to uh, who will help you. You have to explore which works out for you. And the last one, uh, you get thrown this money, which is great, but what do you do with that? You're turning left or right, you just don't know. There's nobody to walk you through it. 
Um, as related to school-based service, caregivers spoke about two main themes. So all spoke about uh, resources and reflected really on their overwhelming scarcity. So, and uh, they also shared concerns about a perceived lack of transparency around how resources, uh, around what kinds of resources were available as well as how they were allocated within different school districts and schools. <coughs> So one father said, I don't know what exists. I have no idea. I have to accept what's there, put up, what, put up with it, otherwise take your child elsewhere. And high and low quality of life participants demonstrated the same distribution of content uh, as they focused more on the perceived unavailability of resources. Participants who spoke about the importance of family school partnerships uh, reflected on positive experiences when this was exemplified across various levels of uh, personnel. So one mother said, it starts at the administration. The administration sets the tone and the teaching staff take that tone. It's hard to find someone that's that dedicated. And partnering was more salient for high quality of life participants, uh, as these individuals were able to share how their school was open to partnering and referenced uh, all levels of staff, from administrators to teachers to aides, um, who exemplified these kinds of characteristics, whereas no one in the low quality of life uh, shared uh, experiences of positive partnerships with schools. 